Thank you. Um, welcome everyone to the uh, Orthopedic Academy combined with ORUK uh, session uh, today about scoliosis presented by Mr. Zachary Silk, who is the consultant orthopedic surgeon uh, specialized in spine surgery in Oxford University Hospital. Uh, he is a member of the BASS and British uh, Scoliosis Society, as well as he is a member of the Royal, uh, Royal Society of Medicine. He was uh, graduated uh, from the Imperial College of uh, School of Medicine with distinction and completed his higher special, speciality training in trauma and orthopedic in the uh, uh, Percival Pot rotation, during which he was inspired to pursue a career in spinal surgery. He has since completed the Integrated Orthopedic and Neurosurgical National Spine Fellowship in Leeds and Subspecialist uh, Deformity Fellowships at the Great Ormond Street and Royal National Orthopedic Hospitals. He is um, he uh, is a very uh, he did an overseas uh, fellowship, uh, which was uh, granted by the BOA and uh, the AO Spine uh, in New York, Philadelphia, and Bologna. Uh, he also now joined the consultant faculty in Oxford, and where he will continue his learning journey in the world of. Uh, uh, spinal surgery. After that, after his presentation, we would like to um, invite you all to participate in taking a part in the poll quiz. After that, we will ask uh, any uh, questions from the uh, audience to Mr. Silk. So please, if there is any questions, you, uh, uh, you write it in the uh, uh, chat box and I will ask Mr. Silk. Then we have interactive questions today uh, instead of Viva, about 12 questions. So please participate in that by either showing interest in a private message to Hannah or Lydia or raising your hands. Um, the, uh, I would like here to promote uh, the intensive FRCS trauma and orthopedics mock Viva and clinical exam courses. These courses are um, very important uh, for the exam and help me personally to pass my exam. Uh, they are very well uh, planned to uh, address uh, uh, to address uh, the exam type questions and to practice uh, for you to practice um, before the exam and close enough to the exam. Uh, we have three, one in, in 9th of September, the uh, uh, other on 14th of October, and then the 2nd of December. Please, if you show interest, you either go to the website uh, or you can uh, scan this uh, uh, QR code. Thank you. I will leave you now with uh, Mr. Silk. Thank you. Joe, thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And I really want to thank OR UK for hosting uh, uh, the event today uh, and also thank all of you uh, for attending I mean we've got nearly 70 people 70 people um, logged in so far so I'm just going to share my screen hopefully we'll get a few more um, during the course of the event and I'm just going to make a suggestion just early on if uh, if anyone's keen to get involved uh, in the interactive part of this then um, just put a little asterisk uh, like rename yourself and just put a little asterisk uh, at the a little star uh, at the beginning of your name, and then, um, uh, and then at least uh, we, we know who's uh, who's keen to get involved um, in some questions later. So scoliosis for the FRCS. I mean, basically, scoliosis comes under pediatric spinal deformity. We're just focusing on uh, the top here, but for the purposes of the exam, I think it's really important to spend some time looking at Sherman's kyphosis and spondylolisthesis. Um, as well, because I think these are these are common um, clinical scenarios, both in the, the MTQ part of the exam, but also in the face to face uh, aspect as well, because these these tend to be stable patients who generally have a pain free condition um, and would be suitable for, for examination. So scoliosis. Right. Um, there's going to be a lot of unicorn references here because uh, I did my fellowship in Leeds. So forgive me for this, but we are going to start about um, uh, start with talking about the normal spine. And um, 
I mean, everybody knows that as a fetus or as a baby, you um, generally have a single curve. It's a primary curve um, uh, where in the fetal position, you've got uh, a global kyphosis. So cervical spine, thoracic spine and uh, lumbar spine tends to, be, it tends to be in a kyphotic position. It's not really until um, the child starts developing that you start developing the secondary curve. So the secondary curves tend to be um start with the neck so cervical lordosis so as a baby is put into tummy time position lifts head up you get a secondary curve in the neck and then as soon as the toddler starts standing a bit more confidently in the upright position you get a secondary lordosis in the lumbar spine so generally generally speaking the vertebrae are wedged forwards generally speaking so uh it, these secondary curves develop as, as a change in the uh shape uh, and morphology uh, of the discs later on in life, okay. Um, but we have to we have to try and understand normal before we understand, before we look to abnormal. And so, I mean, most of you will understand that with respect to the thoracic spine, there are twelve rib bearing vertebrae um, and usually five lumbar vertebrae. Um, but there is also a variety described where you can perhaps get more or less um, rib bearing vertebrae. Uh, due to transitional segments between the thoracic and the lumbar spine. But similarly, you can get the same between the lumbar spine and the sacral spine. So people have often heard of uh, things like lumbaralization or sacralization and so forth. But I think it's imperative in scoliosis to, uh, in, especially in clinical practice, uh, probably less so in an exam, but certainly in, in clinical uh, practice to take into account uh, these differences because uh, it does influence your your level selection when it comes to um, to surgery. So fundamentally, um, a normal spine has a series of four curves. Uh, we tend to be lordotic uh, in the cervical and the lumbar spine, kyphotic in the thoracic spine and the sacrum, and in the coronal plane. So looking at the patient face on, there's no curves, and this 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 is meant to uh, give us uh, overall balance of the head over the pelvis. So if one drops a, a plumb line through the center of C7 uh, vertebrae, it should pass through the, through the posterior superior corner of S1. That, and that would represent um, uh, normal uh, sagittal balance um, or global sagittal balance. And, and, and that makes for very efficient gait, because if the center of gravity passes behind the hips, but we as human beings tend to carry most of our, of our weight in front of uh, the hips, um, then there is some balance between the two. And you're not, you know, sort of work of, of bipedal gait is, is a lot less and much more efficient. And there are some uh, sort of ranges that you might want to uh, commit to memory. So with respect to thoracic kyphosis, I think probably the, the fundamental one is really the 40 degree cutoff because beyond 40, they tend to be hyper kyphotic um, and beyond 60, you may be thinking about, you know, sort of treatment for conditions like Sherman's kyphosis, if that, that is the case, but um, they don't tend to be kyphotic in, in idiopathic scoliosis. And I'll come to that in a minute. Um, well, whereas with a lumbar lordosis, you know, there's a general range between 40 and 60. So we'll uh, focus on scoliosis. Um, I mean, this is a sort of clinical photo and um, x-ray, which we'll come to a bit later in the talk again. So I won't dwell on that right now. Um, but essentially scoliosis, uh, I think it's important to start with the definition. And um, as many of you know, or can describe, it is a lateral curvature of the spine. And so side to side, side curvature of the spine. And there is a fundamental definition where that curvature is angled more than 10 degrees. So anything less than that um, is not technically defined as, as a scoliosis. They've got a lateral curvature of the spine. And maybe, um, you know, maybe due to leg length discrepancy, mild leg length discrepancy, or it may be the start of a scoliosis and something that's been picked up incidentally on an x-ray for another reason. But uh, I think it's important to just bear in mind that it is 10 degrees as a cutoff. Um, and although we do describe it as a lateral side to side curvature, it, scoliosis is really a 3D deformity. Um, so it's not just the lateral curvature, but it's also the fact that one develops a lordosis or hypokyphosis of the thoracic spine um, during the course of developing a scoliosis. And part of, the, part of, part of that, if, if one can understand, if you're looking at me from the side, as the spine grows lordotic, 
the center of gravity is, is sent so far backwards that the only way for the body to restore that center of gravity over the hips is to turn the spine about its axis. And so if I focus on a, there is a CT scan over here, and this is sort of a typical CT scan of, uh, of a patient with scoliosis, we can see how the, how the vertebra has turned into uh, the right hemithorax um, there. And what this would clinically be manifested by is uh, prominence of the left chest wall. Uh, and so many patients, they see, that's what they see. They see when they look in the mirror that they've got prominence of the left chest wall or the left breast. And parents often see what's going on at the back. So the right uh, right sided uh, thoracic cage is a lot more prominent. We call it rib hump uh, or rib prominence. Um, rib hump sounds a bit, um, uh, well, I don't, don't think many patients like, like you calling them uh, or saying they've got a rib hump. So I, I tend to use the word prominence. Um, and it can, in severe forms, affect lung volume. So you can see how the uh, vertebrae can can really, you know, sort of intrude into the chest uh, chest wall and can and can cause kinking of the bronchial tree, uh, as well as compressing the space available for lung development. And that's very very relevant when we talk about early onset uh, scoliosis. So scoliosis is common. I think I, th I think that's why this talk has been put on uh, because it, it, it is absolutely examinable. 10% um, of teenagers tend to have a lateral curvature of their spine of more than five degrees. It's not defined as a scoliosis, but most of that is identified to be due to a mild leg length discrepancy and can be treated with a simple shoe raise. Um, but patients with genuine scoliosis is, you know, so it gets lower as the curvature goes higher. So 2%, um, uh, have curves more than 10 degrees and, and one in 200 have curved more than uh, 20 degrees. And it's really not until one gets to that 20 degree threshold that you start being able to clinically notice it or certainly to an untrained person, you know, sort of 20 degrees tends to be that threshold where people can visibly see, um, see a scoliosis. So it's often, it's often pick up, picked up at that point uh, rather than in the very early phases unless there's an incidental finding on, on some imaging. Um, now, in terms of classification, so we've, start, we've done the definition, we've looked at um, how common it is, uh, but I think it's important to talk about classifications, and there's obviously clinical classifications, there's some radiological ones as well, but with respect to clinical, I'm just going to keep it really simple for you and break it down so we can talk about the onset, so timing of, uh, timing of when their scoliosis developed, um, uh, also discuss you know, whether the scoliosis is structural or non-structural, and then look at the causes, the different types of scoliosis. And then on the radiological front, I mean, it starts getting a little bit more complicated here. And I will briefly mention the Lenke classification, which is more relevant for idiopathic scoliosis, but there are some other classification systems for early onset scoliosis, and the, probably the one that will come up in the MCQ, I would expect, rather than viva settings would be things like rib vertebral angle difference, uh, or the meta angle and rib phases. Um, so, and I, I do remember this coming up in 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 the MCQ based um, exam for myself. So, in terms of age of onset, so in in the past, um, idiopathic types of scoliosis used to be defined uh, according to uh, their age categories. And you may have come across the words infantile idiopathic scoliosis, juvenile idiopathic scoliosis and adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, which is by far the most common. And I'm laboring on the point of idiopathic because some people do forget to use that word here because there are other types of early onset scoliosis. But fundamentally, the, the reason they were categorized in this way was to categorize them according to uh, the time of certain growth spurts. So you tended to have an infantile growth spurt up until the age of three, and then juvenile between four, you know, four to nine, and then idiopathic after puberty. Um, and that that really isn't of clinical significance. Um, but what is of clinical significance, and th this sort of changed um, uh, change in the last sort of 20, 30 years, uh, was um, the fact that people were identifying these patients according to their risk of developing uh, pulmonary um, problems. Uh, so uh, thoracic insufficiency syndrome, fundamentally. So if patients were developing scoliosis early on in life, and the definition used to actually be less than five years rather than less than 10 years, but if it was less than five years of age, um, then they were really going to have problems with uh, uh, 
lung development. Uh, so this is where the SRS uh, classification uh, comes in. I think it's important to bear that in mind. And this is the up-to-date way of discussing uh, the difference between early onset and late onset uh, scoliosis, because also the treatment changes. So it's not just what pathology we're looking at, but with respect to early onset, we're looking at guiding their growth um, uh, versus late onset treatments where, where we're looking to fuse the spine, uh, essentially, okay? Um, so the second classification would be structural versus non-structural scoliosis. So a non-structural curve is just, you know, somebody without a scoliosis essentially bending side to side. Often um, these patients have leg length discrepancies um, or maybe trying to offload um, a, uh, a level of the spine where they're suffering with sciatica. So if they've got protruded disc on one side uh, and leaning to the opposite side, relieves their pain, then, um, then they may develop a non-structural scoliosis. And often if you treat the underlying problem, you know, it, it reverses, it can get better uh, over time. And often with these patients specifically, they don't have the axial rotation component of a structural scoliosis. So a structural scoliosis is one that measures more than 10 degrees, which we've discussed, but with axial rotation and posterior elements. So when you look at the look at the x-ray, you do see that the pedicles um, are turning with respect to the vertebral bodies and the relationship of the pedicles and the spinous process, which is normally in the middle of the two pedicles, it changes. So that, that's where you, you want to keep an eye and that's what would be defined as a, as a, as a structural curve. Now, I think if anyone's read the Lenke classification specifically, I've, well done, um, I would say um, I need to highlight that in his classification or in that classification, they talk about a non-structural curve being less than 25 degrees when you bend. That's just relevant to the surgical management, but a truly non-structural curve, truly non-structural curve re restores itself to zero or beyond, okay? It has to restore itself to zero. That's a true non-structural curve, but for the purposes of definition, um, Lenke's classification describes it as being less than 25. I'm happy to go through that at the end if, if anyone's still confused by that, but I just thought I'd better mention that because there, there is some subtlety there. So in terms of etiology, I think this is, this is probably last of my, I mean, we're, we're basically ramping up in terms of, um, in terms of the intensity of these kind of classifications. So in terms of etiology, most common cause, so 70% of what you're gonna see in a clinic is gonna be idiopathic, but there are congenital causes, and this could be due to a failure of formation or failure of segmentation or a bit of both, so a mixed pattern. There are neuromuscular causes, and you can break that down into neurological causes and myopathic causes. And there is sometimes some overlap between neuromuscular scoliosis and the syndromic type. So syndromics tend to have genetic conditions that are a bit more widespread. They, you know, with multi-organ multi-organ involvement and not necessarily just restricted to uh, the neurological or central nervous system and the um, peripheral nervous system and the, and the, and, and the muscles. Um, in terms of traumatic, I mean, that's sort of very uncommon and pathologic. Again, very uncommon, but we do see this from time to time. So painful tumours of the spine can cause uh, a scoliosis. The typical one would be something like an osteoid osteoma or an osteoblastoma um, would be a typical pathological cause of a scoliosis. But it tends to be that non-structural type where they're just trying to offload the painful side of the spine. Uh, and if you treat that, um, it, it tends to reverse. OK, um, so this is. Uh, available on the web. Uh, it's also available on ortho bullets. This is the lengthy classification. I do not think for the purposes of the exam, you need to learn the insides and outs of the lengthy classification. But if you want to just have a basic understanding of it, um, I think it's important to just break it down. So it does talk about different curve types and where those curves are. So in the thoracic spine, we tend to break down the, uh, break down the thoracic curves into two. So there tends to be a proximal thoracic and a main thoracic, depending on where the apex is. And then there could be a curve in the thoracolumbar or lumbar spine. Uh, thoracolumbar specifically has an apex between T12 T12 L1 disc space and L1 and anything below the L1 2 disc space in terms of apex uh, is classified as the lumbar, lumbar curve. And then, so there's a combination of those curves. 
there's a lumbar modifier, which basically just gives us a sense of the severity of the lumbar curve. So how far the lumbar apex has deviated from the midline and a sagittal modifier, which looks at their sagittal, sagittal profile and balance and whether they have any kyphosis across the thoracolumbar junction. Um, so I'm not gonna dwell on that too much because I, like I said, I, I don't think this is important for the purposes of the exam, but, but nonetheless, uh, it's good to be aware of it. So we'll, we'll move back to our clinical case. And I, essentially the way I'm just gonna work through this is just talk you through some of the elements of the history and the examination that I think are important um, for you to capture uh, in your consultations, whether it's an exam setting or a real life setting. Um, so the way I would tend to go about it is try to find a history about the deformity itself. Um, it tends to be apparent um, and you try to find out whether or not it was early or late. So before or after the age of 10, I think is, is relevant. Um, and try and find out, really try and find out what the main concern is, not just for the, the patient, but also for the, for the parent. Because uh, I mean, I very frequently come across patients who are referred in with a scoliosis, but their primary concern is uh, pain. And it may be mechanical pain, um, it may be non-specific, it may be related to a sinister cause of their scoliosis, um, but pain is very different to the cosmetic uh, aspects of the deformity, which um, you know, sort of leads you down a different treatment path. So I think, I think it's important to just identify the main concerns before you um, sort of move forwards with your, your clinical evaluation. The other things that I tend to look at in the history and examination as well is just what try to get a sense of what their likely skeletal maturity is. So in females, you can ask about uh, the onset of periods. Um, a, a great question that one of my mentors um, uh, used to ask some of his patients was, when was the last time you needed to change your shoe size uh, or get some new clothes? But fundamentally, shoe size, uh, shoe size was, uh, seems to be you know, one that people recall uh, quite often. Um, and then try and find out a history of the potential underlying cause. Okay, I think this is this is important. So, I mean, they may have past medical history themselves or not. There may be a family history, which is important to figure out. Okay, so especially when it comes to syndromic causes, things like Marfan's, neurofibromatosis, you want to kind of think a little bit laterally with respect to uh, their, uh, their causes. And a pediatric history, it's important to go through this, especially if you're dealing with a non-idiopathic or suspecting a non-idiopathic cause uh, of their uh, problem. But if anyone is to mention pain, you must rule out the red flags, okay? You've got to think about tumor, think about infection, um, and, you know, sort of quick screen uh, is, is, is absolutely uh, essential. So moving on to examination. So again, similarly, I, I tend to break this down into um, uh, an examination of the deformity itself. So you can break it down by looking at the patient from the front, the side, and the back. And you can do that in the sitting and the standing position. So the relevance of that is, and I've had this in some of my Viber practice, is if, if you've got a patient with a profound scoliosis and a leg length discrepancy, one of the crucial, way, uh, crucial ways to obliterate the leg length discrepancy as an issue is to sit the patient down because as, as their issue of tuberosities are level on the, on the couch, then you'll be able to see what the residual uh, deformity, so suprapelvic deformity uh, looks like. And some of that does correct. Um, uh, and some patients will just have a combination of both. Uh, so other things are gonna be looking at top shoulders. So look at the neck and the shoulders for symmetry on both sides. Look at the chest wall, look for the rib prominence, both at the front and the back of the spine. Look at the waist. So we're just working our way down. Look at the pelvic height, and look at the, uh, the spine itself to see whether or not they're kyphotic or lordotic. And lordotic, like I say, is, is the most common thing here. You can feel for tenderness, uh, percussion tenderness as well, especially if uh, you're concerned about tumor. Um, and in terms of movement, I guess the key maneuver is the Adams forward bending test, which uh, I'll come to uh, shortly. There are other aspects you can assess on exam. So skeletal maturity, other, you know, secondary sexual char characteristics, I mean, obviously with a chaperone, um, but a lot of this will be, you know, sort of obvious to you, I think, um, when, you, when you examine these patients. And then there's gonna be um, things like, you know, other causes. So atypical deformity. So if they've got a very short, short and sharp dystrophic curve, if they're kyphoscoliotic, these are really atypical. If they've got things like arachnodactyly, a long arm span, 
high arch palate, lens dislocation, sternotomy scars. I mean, you're thinking about Marfan's with that one. So, um, so same for neurofibromatosis, look, at, look in the armpits for auxiliary freckling, um, actual sort of cutaneous neurofibromas, uh, cafe au lait spots, leash nodules in the eyes, uh, optic gliomas, and, and what the parent looks like if they're in the room with the patient and spina bifida, you know, uh, or spinal dysphrophism. So hairy patches, dimples and scars. It's important to pick all of these things up. So you can you can look, you can feel for a collapsing pulse and you can assess if you're concerned about uh, connective tissue disorder, um, assess for hypermobility uh, syndrome as well. But I think, I think the other aspect is neurological assessment. So I've put here abdominal reflex. Um, I mean, abdominal reflexes has been described and has, show, has been shown to be um, associated, if it's absent, associated with an intraspinal pathology. So it may be uh, suggestive that the patient may have um, a Chiari malformation or a syrinx uh, or a tethered cord. So if, if it is absent or asymmetrical, I think that might prompt you to want to do an MRI scan quite early on, on that patient to exclude an intraspinal driver for their scoliosis. Uh, some of you will have heard of the TANA stages of development for um, secondary sexual characteristics. I'm not going to dwell on that um, too much, but the crucial special test in your exam is going to be the Adams forward uh, bending test. Again, that, that essentially um, allows you to take away the gravitational pull on the spine. By just bending them forwards, you can actually reduce the non-structural component to their scoliosis. So everybody with a scoliosis, a structural scoliosis, is going to have a non-structural part to it as well, a part that's reversible. Um, but the stuff that's left behind is structural, and that's what you're looking for on the Adams forward bending test. And what you can see here when the patient is bent forwards, you can, you can see asymmetry in the height of the chest wall, um, and you can palpate that. You can also put a scoliometer on that. So that's a useful device. And you can also get these apps on your iPhone um, uh, to allow you to measure that. But in an exam, you know, you may find one on the side table and it would be absolutely reasonable for you to pick that up and just measure their, uh, measure their deformity. There are some other special investigations you can do, uh, non-invasive ones. So topical assessments like uh, an ISIS scan, but fundamentally where you're, where you're going to, so when you go down the investigation route, you're going to be looking for whole spine radiographs. Um, and a whole spine radiograph is meant to be a whole spine radiograph, but as a minimum, you want C7 to S1, and, um, and you want the full width of the chest, and you want the hips on show. And the reason you want the hips on show is that it gives you a sense of skeletal maturity. So you can look at the triradiate cartilages, you can look for a leg length discrepancy, and you can look for the wrist assign uh, on the iliac uh, crest, but people are, are often concerned about radiation exposure, etc. Um, there is uh, uh, sort of in, in the future uh, things like EOS, uh, which is like a slot uh, scanner, a very low dose um, uh, scanning system that allows you to uh, more safely, I guess, uh, uh, assess uh, scoliosis because many of these patients require imaging every six months, uh, and it can it is associated with an increased risk. Uh, of cancer development. Um, so if you're looking at x-rays, I mean, there's sort of a number of things that um, uh, you can look at. And I've got, I've got another slide that will just sort of better demonstrate this, but um, there are various lines, things like the center sacral vertical line, which is essentially a vertical line uh, that's drawn upwards from the center of the sacrum uh, and allows you to see how far uh, the apex is deviated away from that. Um, you can do um, a cob angle measurement where, and I'll go through that as well shortly, uh, where you're looking for how angled the, the, the curve is. Um, and there's other things to look at, you know, so where the apex of the deformity is and where the concavity and the convexity of the curve is. And there are other measures like the sort of the rotation, vertebral rotation and the relationship of the pedicles, the spinous process and the vertebral bodies, which do come up in the MCQs, but these are not these are very rarely used in clinical practice. So I'm not going to dwell on them uh, today. So in terms of radiographic interpretation, so I've got this, this X-ray um, up. I think crucial thing to pick up is um, that the left is on the left as you're looking at the back of the patient. So the most um, scoliosis x-rays are typically presented in this way. 
Um, I think it's really important that you do orientate your, your right and your left because obviously you're not used to looking at a frontal x-ray of, uh, of the chest back to front and normally the right is on this side. Um, so I just want to point that out. Uh, it tends to be PA as opposed to AP. Uh, it's difficult to, uh, and this, this is a PA and the part of the reason for a PA radiograph is that it reduces the, um, I guess the sort of radiation uh, to the breast tissue. So if the X-ray beams are coming from back to front, it reduces, uh, reduces that and it's thought to reduce cancer risk. So they tend to be PA and they tend to be done in the standing position. Um, and so the things that I look for is gonna be their curve. So this person's got a main thoracic curve They've got a proximal thoracic curve and they've got a lumbar curve. OK, I want to look at the severity uh, of their curves and the apex of their curves. And so if you were looking at the apex, I mean, if you just draw, drew a horizontal line upwards, you'll see where that horizontal line touches. And it could be a vertebra or it could be a disc space. And then there's other things to check, things like balance. So we talk about coronal balance. Uh, there's also sagittal balance on the lateral view. Uh, but coronal balance will be dropping a plumb line from C7 all the way down, comparing that to another line that you draw from the center of the sacrum, the CSVL, all the way up and seeing whether there's a difference between the two. And, you know, up to two centimeters is perfectly, perfectly fine. But beyond that, it can be noticeable. Um, and you can look at the balance of the shoulders as well and the balance of the hips. There are some anomalies to try and pick up on, on your x-rays, so segmentation and formation anomalies. If you do see those, those will prompt you to do further 3D imaging quite early on. Um, count up your vertebrae and count up your ribs. Uh, just make sure they're matching. And with respect to skeletal maturity, and I'll come to that in a second, things like RISA, triradiate cartilages. And if you've got the hand either on view on this image, uh, so some people have described having just having the hand in the picture, just so that you can try and focus in on the growth plates of the hand or doing a separate hand x-ray, you can uh, um, assess, uh, assess bone age that way. So with respect, uh, we're moving on to Cobb angle. So I, there are some practical aspects to the Cobb angle. If I, I very much doubt you're ever gonna be asked to draw one uh, in an exam, but I think for clinical practice, it's important to understand. Um, so there are three main steps. You've got to try and find the end vertebra. The end vertebra basically is the top and the bottom of each curve. And that can be quite, uh, it can be harder in practice to, uh, to figure out than some may think. So, um, I'm, go I'm just going to sort of go to the next slide, actually, really, because I think that describes what I want to say a bit easier. Um, but essentially, the end vertebra is the most tilted vertebra, okay? It's the most tilted vertebra. And so the way I end up um, working that out is I look at, I, I basically follow, follow the um, uh, convexity of each curve, right? And what you end up seeing is that, and I'm sure you can see my arrow, you can see one disc space is wedged open. So I'm not look, looking at the vertebra, I'm looking at the disc space. So this disc space is wedged open, that's closed, open, closed. I've got my arrow there, that's open, that's closed. It's difficult to say what's going on here at the moment, but this is clearly open on the opposite side, yeah? Opposite side, and that's closed. So something has happened between these two curves. And if you really zoom in on this, you could probably say this is a bit more open, than this side. And so as you switch from open, closed to open, closed, that would mean that this is the end vertebra. Okay, and the end vertebra, this is an end vertebra for this curve, and this is an end vertebra for that curve. Okay, so you can have one end vertebra for two curves, and where you end up doing your measurements from will be at the top of the end vertebra for the bottom curve, and the bottom of the end vertebra for the top curve. Um, so I hope, I hope that, you know, if any of you have struggled with Cobb angles, that just makes sense. But you, essentially what you're looking for is the transition between uh, the wedging, so the opening and closing of the disc space on one side of the spine, so the opening and the closing of the disc space on the opposite side of the spine. That, that is the transition point from one curve to the other. And that vertebra, where it's different on both sides, is the end vertebra. Risa sign. So Risa sign is um, 
it's quite a crude way of assessing skeletal maturity, but because the pelvis is easy to visualize on, um, on an X-ray, it is the most common way that we, we look at things. But risk of zero um, is essentially before any of this shows up. Uh, so th this iliac crest hypothesis, this doesn't appear um, until two thirds of the way along your pubertal growth spurt. So you've missed quite a long period of time before you see the iliac crest hypothesis appear as a RISA one, and it's divided up into uh, quarters. Okay, so RISA one, two, three, four will take you all the way to the back of the pelvis. And then once it's at the back of the pelvis, it tends to knit its way, you know, it tends to fuse down to the uh, ilium from back to front, at least that's how I've, uh, I've seen it. And so that will equate to RISA five on the opposite side. And, it, and for girls, um, girls tend to be considered skeletally mature at RISA four, and boys tend to be uh, considered skeletally mature at RISA five. Um, and that, that's relevant when it comes to sort of treatment or uh, and decisions about treat, uh, certain types of treatment. A slightly more accurate way of looking at things, and you know, this is, um, Something that I guess I'm more frequently using in my practice now is uh, hand X-rays to look at look at bone age, but specifically look at the growth plates, um, because there is an association between uh, the closure or the development of the growth plates uh, in different uh, parts of the hand uh, and your and your risk sign. And you know, for me, um, if I if I see somebody who's like a risk of one or two, and I'm not sure if I should brace them. And I do a hand X-ray. It will tell me whether or not I've got op enough opportunity to modulate their growth or not. Because what you don't want to do is to put somebody unnecessarily into uh, a bracing program if they're too skeletally mature. And I think just RISA is probably not good enough uh, in terms of uh, giving you a, a sense of uh, of that. But here, here we've got like a growth velocity um, and height uh, gain sort of diagram, it's just, just, just to give you a sense of where things are. So girls tend to, um, you know, sort of go through their pubertal growth spurt a lot sooner than boys. Um, you know, most commonly we would say between 12 and 14, and by 14 they tend to stop uh, growing, but boys, it tends to be later, usually between 14 and 16. Um, but if we have a look at this growth, uh, growth chart, uh, so RISA zero, triradiates open, that's when you really accelerate with respect to your growth rate. And it continues accelerating up until the point that your triradiate cartilage is closed. So you can see here that once you drop into RISA one, that's when your uh, growth rate starts declining. And so from my perspective, um, anything between zero and two is high risk for progression. Three, it's kind of in the middle. Four fives tends to be uh, not, pro not much progression um, uh, or certainly not much progression in the short term. There are some uh, some other x-rays So we've talked about, I guess, the standing whole spine x-ray. I think it's also important to bear in mind that for, for surgical planning, um, it's very helpful to have some, uh, I guess, um, traction uh, or flexibility assessments of the spine. So you can clinically assess them with respect to their flexibility, but it's nice to be able to measure that so you know whether or not you're, you're gonna need to do additional work or addi take additional steps at the, at the time of surgery to release the spine. And that may be involving quite substantial releases of the discs as well as the facet joints at the back of the spine, or it could be that you just re uh, do facet joint resections at the back of the spine alone. Um, and so a flexibility assessment can be done with you pulling the patient. So this is a traction view. Uh, there are other ways um, uh, to do this, like the fulcrum bending view. Again, this is a bit much for the exam, but it's just to give you a practical sense of some of the options that might be out there in your, in your units. And what you end up seeing is uh, this is the curve before and how it bends out to 48 degrees uh, from 73 degrees. And, you know, from my perspective, that that also gives me a sense of, you know, whether or not it's going to be, a, a, what the clinical outcome is going to be at the end. You know, you, you can really have a conversation with the patient and say, well, this is very flexible. This is where it's going without any release and without the addition of screws and rods. Um, so the likelihood is I'll be able to get it straighter than this. Um, or if they're not moving at all, then you can give them fairly guarded prognosis, okay? 
So we'll go back to our case. Um, I mean, briefly, if I was going to describe this clinical scenario to you, so examining this young girl from the back, I can see she's got left shoulder elevation. She's got prominence of the right, um, uh, right thoracic cage and the scapula. She's got asymmetry of the waist with flattening on the right-hand side, a more prominent left hip, and she's got a loin crease, okay? And when she bends forwards, um, we can also quite clearly see that she has, um, she has a rib hump here or rib prominence uh, on the right side, consistent with the diagnosis of structural scoliosis, okay? And if you went to town on this, you'd say, well, there's no features of uh, Marfan's or uh, neurofibromatosis to suggest an underlying cause, but then you'll go on to do an examination of their neurological system briefly, okay, just looking for upper motor neurone signs specifically and the absence of um, absence of uh, the abdominal reflex. And then with respect to the radiograph, so looking at this radiograph, it, it matches up clinically quite well in the sense that she has left shoulder elevation, she has um, truncal shift so the the chest if i look at the chest the chest if i if i draw a straight line down from the outside of the chest it doesn't fall um on the outside of the pelvis which it should line up with so the, the trunk itself has shifted you can see with respect to the soft tissue shadows that there's asymmetry of the waist there's maybe a mild leg length discrepancy but not that significant at all um, and then looking at the curve, she's got a structural, I, I haven't measured this, but it's fairly sizable, structural, proximal thoracic, main thoracic, and lumbar curve um, as well. So uh, we're going to move forward to, I guess, treatment. Um, so the fundamental questions you need to be asking, um, or you will be asked, is whether or not you're going to be um, uh, doing surgery for this patient. And so you could do an operation but I wouldn't jump straight to that in your examination answer. Um, you could brace them, okay? Uh, and so with respect to bracing um, curves between 20 and 40 degrees or 20 and 45 degrees uh, tend to be braced, uh, especially if uh, they've got a risk of progression. I'll go on to that in a second, or you could just simply observe them. Okay, and if there's one paper you need to be able to quote from um, the literature, I think it's going to be this one. It's the BRACE trial. Uh, it was a randomized controlled trial comparing active observation and bracing in patients with idiopathic scoliosis uh, with curves between 20 and 40 degrees. Uh, and essentially the, the failure point was if their curve had reached 50 degrees or they went on to have surgery. Okay, and what they found uh, is um, that there is a, you know, sort of significant benefit to having, having a brace. So if, if patients are, are wearing it for extended periods of time, so more than 17 hours, ideally, ideally up to 23 hours in the day, they're getting the best results. And there's 90% success rates um, with that. But patients who are not using it regularly or during the day they may may as well not be wearing it at all okay so compliance is super important for these uh, these types of patients um but also at what cost one needs to be considerate of that because braces are not completely uh, benign in terms of treatment there are issues with skin i think at their age so especially teenage uh, years uh, psychosocial effects can be a massive problem there's a lot of stigma associated uh, with this. And also there's a, uh, a feeling that they may also get uh, sort of disuse atrophy of them, um, core muscles and go on to develop problems like back pain and so forth uh, in the future. But I think one thing to be, you know, sort of quite excited about is that the UK has, um, is, you know, sort of, I guess, first in the world to compare two different types of braces. So full-time versus a nighttime brace, which hasn't got any uh, significant experience. We, we don't have any significant experience of that here in the UK, but it is used in other parts of Europe. And we're looking to see whether or not um, uh, the nighttime brace uh, compares favorably or in a similar way to, uh, performs in a similar way to a full-time brace. Because for some children who really struggle with the idea of wearing one throughout the, throughout the day, this may provide them with a second option um, uh, so that they have a brace just at nighttime alone. Okay, so in terms of um, your surgical decision making, I mean, we'll just go through uh, the algorithm that I use, um, but, you know, fundamental thing, like I say, the first question at the beginning of this is, 
like what what is it that they want is are they really concerned about cosmesis here about the size of their curve um, you want to have a sense of whether or not their curve is going to be progressing uh, so uh, before and also after maturity. So if they're if they're not skeletally mature, risk of zero to two. You are really concerned that there is going to be um, progression. If they are skeletally mature and they've got a sizable curve, so a curve more than fifty degrees. Um, I mean, it's probably even less now. I think there was a recent paper um, published in JBJS. Oh, sorry, the BJJ um, Bone and Joint Journal, which. Uh, which shows that even milder curves continue progressing in skeletal maturity. I mean, there, there are limited papers that have looked at long-term, you know, sort of long-term follow-up on these patients. But the classic is if you've got a curve more than 50 degrees at skeletal maturity, you're likely to progress by half a degree to a degree per year. Um, but I think there is fairly good evidence that that can even happen at lower degrees of severity. Um, then you can think about what approach you might use. So if you were thinking about doing surgery, were you gonna, are you going to do this just from the back, the front, uh, or a combined approach, depending on, uh, I guess, curve size and curve stiffness? I think a composite of those two uh, would inform your decision. And then in terms of what levels. Now, with respect to fusion levels, I mean, we could talk to, you know, all evening about fusion levels. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that here, but the fundamental take home is that we tend to just fuse the structural parts of the curve. Okay, we want to leave as much of the non structural moving parts um, uh, uh, uninstrumented so that it doesn't take away too much function. Uh, so, broadly speaking, if a cob angle is less than 20 or 25 degrees, observe, uh, observe them. If it's anywhere between 25, I've got 35 for some reason here, but 25 to 45, you can brace them if they're skeletally immature. If they're mature, so three and beyond, three, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother starting a brace, it's probably too late, um, but certainly four and five, uh, you could offer surgery if they're severe enough or you could just observe them, okay? And these are the goals of, uh, goals of surgery, okay? So, um, you know, the primary goal is really to correct, well, correct deformity, but also to prevent the progression of their curve. I think that's what I always tell patients, you know, I'm, I'm offering you an operation or an opportunity to prevent this from getting worse. The bonus of that is that I can, I can correct the deformity at the same time. I'm looking to do this in a way that maintains your, 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 your center of gravity or your alignment of the spine. So the head, the chest and the pelvis all line up nicely. And I want to do this in the way that also levels your shoulders out, especially if they've got if they've come to you with shoulder imbalance. And I'm trying to preserve as much motion as possible. So although you can make them have a very nice straight spine on an X-ray by fusing lots and lots of levels, uh, it doesn't necessarily do well for them. So all all of these um, uh, should be taken into account of. I guess if you were talking about the goals of scoliosis surgery. And these are some of the results you might see. So this is a posterior instrumented fusion. Uh, these are pedicle screws and these are rods um, which are used to correct just this structural element of the curve and this non-structural bit. So we don't have a bending film to show you, but if this, if we did have a bending film uh, of this, I would expect it to bend out to less than 25 degrees, if not bend out completely straight. And if it does do that, it gives you fairly a fairly decent amount of confidence to go in and do an operation that is limited to just the uh, structural element of their spinal curvature because this is spontaneously corrected and that's a great result for this patient. Um, some may have heard of um, some, like, I mean, this is this is really old now, but nevertheless, we're st we still don't have this available um, on the NHS. It's just available for, for research purposes, but vertebral body tethering is, is sort of an emerging treatment. I think the evidence... Um, is still fairly limited to justify its use, but I guess it is similar to uh, how one would think about um, eight plates uh, on the knees for, for treatment of various or valgus deformities, uh, whereby people are essentially tethering uh, the um, convexity uh, of the spine from the front. The idea being that you're trying to increase the pressure in the growth, uh, growth plates on that side to inhibit growth and allow them to grow on the opposite side. But the problem with any so I guess mechanical device being applied to a moving joint or spine is that it's going to be under mechanical load all the time and, and subject to failure. And so there's very high, high failure rate uh, documented um, with this procedure and a fusion operation, um, especially if it's just restricted to the thoracic spine, probably, probably is just as good, if not better, 
than a vertebral body tethering, like this motion preserving um, uh, procedure, because you don't really move that much through your thoracic spine anyway. So, uh, so where its benefit would be ideally seen would be in the lumbar spine if if that was feasible. But again, you're putting more weight, more pressure through the lumbar spine uh, for this. So. I don't think this is, again, I don't think this is re particularly relevant for the exam, but it may be something of interest to you just to show you that there are some emerging technologies looking to modulate growth um, in a similar way to how we're, how we're used to doing this in other parts of the spine. And this is, so I guess this is just an x-ray just for, for, for completion, just to show you, you can't actually see the tether on there. So somebody's actually just drawn that, drawn that in there in red, because uh, it's obviously a see-through plastic um, cord. This question is, how do you do an abdominal uh, reflex? Uh, so, well, I, so I, th I think the key thing is to get the patient uh, exposed properly. So they, they do need to lower their um, trouser waist or um, underwear just down to the waist. And essentially there are four quadrants you want to test. And the way I do it is just use the uh, sharp end of a reflex hammer. Um, start, a, start at the level of the belly button and go away in four quadrants and essentially what you're looking to see is the contraction of the belly button towards uh, towards the side that you've scra um, scratched uh, so there'll be a small little contraction there that's um, that's how to do the abdominal reflex um the second question is that is there an age threshold for a surgical management in adults with symptomatic scoliosis um so it depends on the cause so we've talked we've talked about um I guess you know, sort of pediatric pediatric scoliosis. So the one cause of scoliosis uh, in the etiology section that I didn't mention is degenerative scoliosis. So it depends what we're talking about. If we're talking about untreated pediatric scoliosis, and many many patients are untreated or they're treated with braces um, or active observation, and later on in life develop problems, um, there isn't there isn't a I wouldn't say there's a threshold for treatment in terms of age, uh, but their symptoms differ so in early so so early presentation they may be talking about deformity and appearance usually it's appearance that's the primary concern um, later on in life it tends to be pain but their pain tends to be a lot more different at that stage so if you're if you're loading your discs in an asymmetrical way for a long period of time you may find that you develop early onset arthritis within those intervertebral joints and the facet joints and they can develop pain and so you will treat them just as if you saw as you know sort of any back pain patient physical therapy painkillers um facet joint or uh, blocks or um injections and nerve roots as as needed but if that fails then you're talking about surgical surgical options but you're doing surgery to relieve them of pain um it's different. Like I say, it's, it's very, very different it, just in terms of the goal uh, for, for the adult patient compared to the pediatric patient. And that, so that's the untreated pediatric cohort. And then there's the degenerative cohort, which is, you know, presented, they present over the age of 50, 60 with de novo uh, changes in their discs. So they've collapsed in their discs at multiple levels um, uh, for a number of reasons. And they are, again, suffering with pain but a different kind of deformity. So I've mentioned that the pediatric scoliosis patient tends to develop a lordosis, and then to deal with the lordosis, they twist their spine to try and keep it straight and upright. The degenerative patient is very different. Their discs fail, okay? And then once their discs fail, they start developing a rotational abnormality in the spine and scoliosis with that. And so they develop kyphosis. That's why the phrase kyphoscoliosis is always an atypical cause of scoliosis or pathological cause of scoliosis rather than lordoscoliosis, which is the description of an idiopathic type of scoliosis and the most common type of scoliosis we see.